rednecks in Appalachia, black people in the black belt, where the timber is, you know, something like 70% of Alabama is timberland. We don't own the wealth. We're in the same condition. lifelong southerner uh, i know my co-host jacob is i believe you are as well um yep. and just you know the word redneck brings up a lot of thoughts and experiences for me in terms of my own relationship with you know southern identity so to speak um like a lot of southern white boys you know i grew up with uh, my confederate flag paraphernalia and, and um you know certainly at various points would have proudly proclaim myself a redneck been called a redneck as a slur as well you know the whole gamut of those experiences and uh, i think there's a lot to dissect when it comes to the south we're, we're we are a unique region in this country and this being a labor movement show of course we've talked a lot about the challenges to organizing in the south some of the unique challenges and some that um are not so unique, but maybe are more uh, pronounced here in some ways. And, and those run the gamut from hostile laws and governments to uh, entrenched social divisions to chronic underdevelopment. And, and all of those have played a role in the labor movement, you know, having some struggles to gain success across the South, you know, in the past and the present. Um, and really, the Southern working class more broadly struggles, uh, struggles deeply. Um, when, when we compare the quality of life and the material conditions for working class people in the South to the rest of the country, or even to most of the developed world, um, we're, we're lagging behind. And I think those, those are all important things to consider when we talk about, you know, building a movement in the South and certainly in Alabama. So we've talked a little bit uh, on our show previously, and you've, you mentioned it uh, already today about some of the ways that the South, places like Alabama, function as internal colonies to be hyper-exploited. And something we've also talked about on the show is, is economic development in the South. You know, what that typically looks like is our politicians groveling but, you know, underneath multinational capitalists, uh, attempting to lure them here with generous subsidies, little to no taxes, minimal worker and environmental protections, low wages, low union density. And for this, we as everyday people, working class people, we're supposed to be grateful. You know, we're supposed to be thankful for this job creation. Um, so with all that preamble out of the way I, I wanted to turn it over to you to kind of expand on on that in terms of the south and and how does the south relate to the rest of the world um and and certainly how does it relate to the rest of the country sure um so two two things to begin with i want to say that we use the word redneck we know that it means white working class southerner but we use it aspirationally to indicate all workers of the American and global South, which we combine to call the deep South. Um, if you look at our economy, the most profitable industry in profitable, not the biggest, but the most profitable industry in Alabama is timber. Our only billionaire, Jimmy rain is a timber baron. Mm -hmm. And that is a completely extractive um, and export oriented economy. 60% right. of all timber land in Alabama is absentee owned. So we don't own the wealth. The rednecks, rednecks in Appalachia, black people in the black belt, where the timber is, you know, something like 70% of Alabama is timberland. We don't own the wealth. We're in the same condition, whether you're a, a, you know, a white person in Appalachia or a black person in the black belt where the timber is, we're in the same situation. We don't own the wealth. Now that is no different from Mexico or Paraguay or Laos or, you know, Uganda or any other global South, what's often called third world country. That is the way their economies are organized. Now, some of these economies are organized around the extraction of labor. 
which is what the auto industry is doing. It's coming down here looking for cheap labor and extracting labor. Where else are Fords and Nissans and Toyotas and Hondas built? Well, Mexico, the Philippines, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's the same model economy in the American South as it is in the global South. We put these two together. We call it the Deep South. And we say, we want everybody in the Deep South to identify as a redneck or a worker in resistance. Mm -hmm. Now, there is historical precedent for this. Um, the Battle of Blair Mountain in 1921 was a diverse resistance of miners to the federal government and the Pinkertons. And it was the second instance in American history of aerial bombing of American soil. The first instance was two, week, uh, two weeks earlier in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where the American government bombed Black Wall Street. So you see what they do to Black people, they eventually do to Appalachia. So what we really want to see, we want the term redneck to mean and for us to understand ourselves as a colonized subject, right? So there's the material stuff that I've been talking about that is that tells us that we're a colonized subject. Well, what about the subjective or cultural parts that tell us we're a colonized subject as well? And you have to look no further than a film that is in the Library of Congress as historically, aesthetically, and culturally significant, and that film is Deliverance, in which it shows a redneck raping a suburban white man in the forest. And rednecks are either defined as sexually deviant and violent or simple. In, in that film, they're either defined as sexually deviant and violent or simple and basic. This is a common theme in media. If you watch like ring commercials, the doorbell with the camera on it, you watch like ring commercials. In the 80s and 90s, in the, you know, some of the 2000s, it was a black person who would have been the thief on the ring commercial. Right. Now, if you get the ring commercial, it's going to be a redneck who's the thief on the ring commercial. So they're giving us these messages to tell us that we're lesser, less than human. And they do that so that they can justify exploiting our resources and taking our wealth and land. Yeah, I, I, I think that's something that um, is lost, lost a lot in conversations about the South. And, and you see um, a lot of times from from liberals uh, who, you know, will write off the South. You know, uh, it's pretty common to see tropes from liberal corners about, you know, we should just let the South succeed again, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, when when hurricanes and natural disasters hit the South, there's some condescension there of, oh, you know, these red states and you know, this is what they deserve, or oh, I bet you they'll, they'll line up for their socialist FEMA handouts now. And, and all those things, I think, um, confuses the ruling structures of the South with the people of the South. Exactly. I, I, I want to ask you a question. What percentage of Alabamians voted for Donald Trump? That's a good question. Let's see. It was what? About 60% of those who actually voted, uh, which I guess would have been maybe what? 60% or less turnout overall. So we're talking what? Maybe a quarter of the population, if that. 37%. And 38% uh, of voting eligible Alabamians did not vote. So more people in Alabama did not vote or voted for Joe Biden than voted for Donald Trump. Right. So this, this red state, blue state crap is propaganda designed to pit us against each other and make sure that we never get on the same page. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's some, something that we try to focus on on this show to, to cut beyond the partisanship, uh, because ultimately... We have to be looking at the society around us as as working people and as fellow working people and how we relate to power in, in our community, how we relate to the economy. Um, and, and that cuts far beyond the partisanship that is, you know, basically a spectacle in corporate media to be consumed. It's it's a and, you know, the, not to get too off topic here, but there's 
I found it interesting over the years. You've seen like this convergence of, you know, the CNNs and Fox News, the corporate media cycles with sports and entertainment. Um, mm-hmm. and, and they all kind of like look alike now. They all basically talk about some of the same stuff. Um, and it's all just one giant spectacle. And, and I think that's why it's important to to get back to the roots uh, of who has power, who has wealth, where's the wealth come from, where's it going? Um, because it's easy to get lost in, in a lot of spectacle unless you are in touch with, you know, those, those material realities that we're experiencing as folks uh, living here in Alabama and across the South. So Yeah, and I, I, I think that, uh, you know, there the south is the most diverse region in the united states but we're all southerners we all like our green sloppy and our Mm -hmm. chicken and it don't matter if you're black white or latino we all like this stuff and we there are differences in our cultures that are important that we need to celebrate and not fight over there are differences in our culture that are important that we need to celebrate and not fight over. But there are also a lot of similarities in our cultures because we have working class cultures and there's similarities in cultures in working class cultures all over the world. Folk music, for instance, you know, we're talking about the same stuff. You know, the blues and bluegrass came from the same place, um, you know, and every culture has some sort of folk, folk music, which comes from the struggles of the common people. And, you know, I think we need to recognize our differences and celebrate them, but also recognize where we're, we got things in common and bond around those things. Absolutely. And, and that's where, you know, those shared struggles can be so powerful. The, the relationships forged in struggle uh, can be so powerful. And that's, to me, one of the most promising things about unions and the labor movement is its ability to bring people together across all these divisions, you know, some of which are real and some of which are, are propped up and artificial. Um, and I think we've seen throughout the history of Alabama a, a real radical history of people coming together across race, across gender, religion, uh, and other divisions. We've seen people come together to fight back against the elites in control, and we've seen them come together to fight for their common interest, um, whether that's through labor organizing or through other organizing. I mean, Alabama is, the civil rights movement in Alabama changed the world. Um, And so it wasn't just the Bull Connors of the world. Uh, You also had a mass movement on the other side fighting for a better world. And I think that's something that uh, it's it's easy for folks, especially outside the South, to write us all off as as bigots and uneducated and um, reactionaries, and we have our share of those, like everybody else does. Um, they disproportionately hold power uh, down here, but there's there's a whole beautiful history of of Alabama and the South um, where ordinary working class people come together and fight for a better future and a better community. And I think that's the story we have to keep highlighting. And I think we're seeing it right now with workers organizing and Birmingham Starbucks and um, workers holding the line over 500 days on strike in Brookwood, workers trying to take on the the most powerful corporation in the world and and Amazon at the Bessemer warehouse. So you know, those stories are out there and it's it's a matter of us, uh, yeah, you know, remembering what we do have in common and how we can really help each other um, because there's strength in numbers when we come together. And, and we do have those differences, as you mentioned, uh, but that can, that, can, that can make us stronger by bringing in these diverse p- perspectives and experiences that we all have. We all chip in our piece to the puzzle. You know, I think... I think the story we need, that needs to be told that's not told enough is the story of the populist movement in the 1880s and the 1890s. Oh, yes. Which, which was about labor organizing. It was black and white working class. And it was so powerful that uh, the planters and the industrialists had to steal all of the elections 
leading them to create the 1901 Redeemer Constitution, which would break the back of the populist movement using white supremacy and lay the groundwork for Jim and Jane Crow uh, in the 1920s. And, you know, that movement was so powerful that it brought forth a new constitution. Mm. Um, And I think we need to tell that story. And it's not told. That's the thing. That story about Alabama and about the South, because the populist movement was Southwide, that story is not told because it's a threat to the powerful. It's a real threat to the powerful to be able to say, hey, look, black and white people got on the same page and they, for all intents and purposes, won, but it was stolen from them. I'm so glad you brought that up because that was, you know, on my mind as I was trying to think of of some of the struggles throughout our history. And uh, I, I absolutely agree. I think it's clear that, you know, we won the governorship back then and they cheated. Uh, and that's a common theme in Alabama and Southern history is uh, what they fear the most is when working class people can unite across race and across other differences and they will cheat and lie and steal uh, whenever and however they can to smash that unity. Uh, they fear that unity. But we have enough examples throughout our history where that unity has happened and, and the potential that is there. Uh, and I think that's something that um, that continues to inspire me as, as hard as it is sometimes in the South to, uh, to keep going uh, against such odds. There's such potential here. And, and as the, we have a, a huge array of natural wealth here, we have uh, people who are hardworking, people who are diverse. And the moment we ever all, you know, can come together uh, along our common interest as working class people, we can really, we could reshape this state and it could be something beautiful. And you speak of, uh, I want to get back a little bit to what we were talking about before you speak of the governorship being stolen. Mm -hmm. Have has have any of us ever heard a story of a global south leadership a global south country's leadership being stolen from the people by let's say it colonists right so insert latin american country here right yeah exactly so what we're talking about is the same again the same situation and we need to the american south needs to study simone bolivar it needs to study Zapata. It needs to study Subcommandant Marcos. It needs to study the lead revolutionary leaders of the of Latin America to learn how we can fight back and overcome our differences in the American South. We in the American South need to learn from the global South about how to fight in this situation. Yeah, I think that's that's right on. And and I think that's something that I personally um we'll be doing more of and it's something that I, I encourage everyone else to as well and you know we don't talk a lot about international issues on this show or you know um foreign policy those sorts of things but i think this is a really important discussion and a really important thing to to keep in the back of your mind as we talk about the south the ways in which we are related to the global south the, the similarities and and how our working class is treated uh, the similarities and how our economies are structured, um, the similarities and how progressive movements are responded to uh, by those in power when we have them. And so I think that's really important. And something that I, I found inspiring uh, this summer at the Labor Notes Conference in Chicago was hearing from workers at the uh, GM plant in Mexico who were able to kick out the corrupt union and create their own independent union and and and, you know that's that's just to kind of tie it all back into labor and and into the union movement that's what i would encourage my brothers and sisters out here uh to think about as you know we we have our concerns about jobs being off offshored we have our concerns um about globalization and free trade obviously And, and there's Unfortunately, you know, a lot of resentment towards immigration as well. Uh, but the solution is not 
to divide us further or to embrace xenophobia and nationalism. The solution is to work together to make all of our lives better. And when those workers in Mexico and Paraguay are organizing, that will ultimately only help us and vice versa. Uh, and so that's one of the most inspiring things about the labor movement at its best is when you see that solidarity and you see workers from all over the country cheering each other on, you know, chipping in a couple bucks here and there, sending pizza to the picket line. That's what it's all about. Remembering what we have in common and how much stronger we are when we come together. Um, so to get off my soapbox there for a second, uh, Zach, was there anything else you really wanted to uh, to to get out there as we kind of tie up this conversation about the South and, and where we sit in relation to the global South and the rest of the world? No, I, I covered everything that I wanted to cover, and I appreciate you having me on, and I appreciate what uh, uh, Valley Labor Report does for our community, and um, I'm really happy to see the success y'all are having. Um, uh, it's really, it's a pos- it's a real positive thing. We need our own media. We really need our own media, um, and it's uh, a really, y'all are honest, y'all are straightforward, Um, And y'all talk to the people. Y'all don't um, talk at the people. And I appreciate y'all. And, uh, you know, power to the people. Well, hell yeah, Zach. I really appreciate that. Appreciate your kind words and your support. Um, I want to give you a final chance to, you know, plug your websites and and everywhere else. Uh, People need to go to find your work and support your work. Uh, but yeah, thank you for the conversation. Thank you for the, for the kind words. We absolutely do need our own, working class, independent media, free from corporate overlords and uh, right wing cranks, which so dominate our media landscape. And uh, we need our own bases of power, our own bases of support, our own wealth. And, and that's what you're working on. That's what we're working on. So, Zach, give us a where, where can folks find your work and, and support your work? So uh, you can find what we're doing on automotivefreeclinic.org. You can. Uh, Go to automotivefreeclinic.org back, uh, slash fellowship to apply for the Redneck Studies Fellowship, which includes a $100 stipend. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Redneck Activist, and you can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Facebook at Zach Silverman Hyden, and you can find me on Instagram at The Mad Redneck. So uh, I'm all over social media. Come, come holler at me. Come tell me you think I'm crazy. You know, I'll talk to you. I'll talk. If, if you're not, if you're not a, a ridiculous ideologue of the left or the right, and you can have a decent, meaningful conversation with somebody without getting all pissy about it, I'll have a conversation with you. Awesome. Well, thanks, Zach. Appreciate your time. Appreciate your work. All right, man. Take care. You just saw a clip from the Valley Labor Report. We are live every Saturday morning from 9.30 a.m. till 12.30 p.m. And we pride ourselves on keeping all of our content free to everybody so that we can talk to as many working folks as possible. If you support the work that we're doing, you think that it's important, you think that it's good, then consider making a monthly contribution to the project. And you can do that on our website, tvlr.fm. 